After the period of the judges came the period known as the monarchy in Israel. The first king was King Saul, but he was not a man after God's own heart as David was. David became king in Hebron and reigned there for seven years before being brought here to what was called Jebus, where the Jebusites dwelt. Below me is the area where David conquered through a water shaft, saying to his men, whoever climbs up the water shaft and conquers the Jebusites shall be chief over my army. The Bible tells us that was Joab. From that day forward, a long and firm relationship was established, and God did a mighty work through David in this city. Let's get more of the story of David and the city of Jerusalem as we fly over 2 Samuel in the Bible from 30,000 feet. As the record of the prophet Samuel continues, one man emerges, and that is David, a shepherd, prophet, warrior, and king. As you have turned to 2 Samuel chapter 1, I am turning to a psalm that I'm going to read at the beginning because in just a few verses, we have a summary by one of the psalmists of what we're about to read in the next couple of weeks. This is Psalm 78, and I'm reading beginning in verse 70. The Lord chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds from following the ewes that had young he brought him, to shepherd Jacob his people and Israel his inheritance. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. Just a few verses out of the Psalms give us in summary form what we're about to read in the book of Samuel. How he went from shepherding in the fields, that is David, to serving in the court, that is the court of Saul, to being sovereign over the nation as he was anointed to be the next king of the nation of Israel. Well, 2 Samuel, it's an interesting title for a book, especially since the name Samuel doesn't appear at all in the entire book. You say, well, what's up with that? Well, what's up is that Originally, in the Hebrew manuscript, 1st and 2nd Samuel were under one title, the book of Samuel. We know that Samuel probably wrote 1st Samuel up until his death in chapter 25, and then it was written by someone else. We think 2nd Samuel, though it bears his name, was written by the prophet Nathan. And the one who's highlighted in this book is none other than David. It's really a story about how he became the king of Israel. And so that's what we're going to be looking at tonight in the first 10 chapters of 2 Samuel. A few weeks ago, maybe it's been a couple months by now, but I mentioned a book that was written by Michael Shapiro called The Jewish 100. And the book is about the 100 most influential Jews in all of history and a little biographical sketch on each one. Number one on the list is Moses, according to Shapiro, the great lawgiver. Number two on Shapiro's list is Jesus Christ. Number three is Albert Einstein. Number four, Sigmund Freud. Of course, this is all according to Shapiro. Number 11 on his list and in the book, The Jewish 100, is King David. Here's the setting. The first king of Israel, King Saul, is dead. The Philistines had invaded the north. They had previously been just down south. Now they went up and took over Galilee. The battle took place on Mount Gilboa. Saul and his three sons were killed in that battle. And David now will see him ascending to the throne as the next king. Now David is the main character. He's certainly not perfect, but he is called a man after God's own heart. And you may remember how the prophet Samuel told King Saul, the kingdom is going to be ripped away from you because you've been disobedient. And it will be given to a man after God's own heart. That happens to be David. He's the man after God's own heart. Doesn't mean he's perfect. He's not Superman with kryptonite. He falls. He fails. He has blunders. But he's a man after God's own heart. Or as one translation, the Knox version of the Bible puts it, he is a man to fulfill God's 
purpose. And he does that. Well, let me give you the outline of the entire book. It'll be helpful for the next couple weeks of study. You could outline 2 Samuel as a book in three sections. Chapters 1 through 10, David's triumphs. We'll see how he makes it to become the king of, first of all, the southern kingdom, and then the entire nation. David's triumphs, chapters 1 through 10. Number two, David's transgressions, chapters 11 and 12. We'll cover how he blew it. And then finally, the rest of the book, chapter 13 to 24, David's troubles. His triumphs, his transgressions, and his troubles. And his troubles are because of his transgressions. But tonight we're going to be looking in chapters 1 through 10 at David's triumphs. Now, I'm going to begin in chapter 1 at verse 4. Here's the setting. A man comes from the battle that has just happened on Mount Gilboa in the previous book where Saul and his sons die. And in verse 4, David said to him, How did the matter go? Please tell me. And he answered, The people have fled from the battle. Many of the people are fallen and dead. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead also. If you have the freedom to write in the margin of your Bible or at the beginning of the chapters, and you can write in pencil so that you don't feel unspiritual, you can always erase it, you could entitle chapter 1, Crying Over the King. That's what David does as he hears this horrible news. Now think back with me. Think back to 1 Samuel chapter 15, where Saul has been instructed to kill the Amalekites, and he does not do that. He brings King Agag back and he brings some of the best of the flocks and the spoils for himself, though he glosses over it with spiritual talk. And there, Samuel says, God has ripped away the kingdom from you and is going to give it to a man after his own heart. Because God told you, King Saul, to destroy the Amalekites. Now, Remember that what we said about that. The Amalekites were those people who had for years been enemies of the Jews, tried to kill them when they left Egypt, attacked the old people and the feeble people when they left Egypt. And so now God says, get rid of all of them. And though it sounds harsh and though it sounds cruel, God was thinking of their future. You see, we understand why when we come to the book of Esther... And there was a guy named Haman who tries to destroy all of the Jews in the Persian Empire. Haman was called an Agagite. Say that ten times. Agagite. <laughs> Meaning he was related to King Agag, who was spared initially by King Saul, who was an Amalekite. See, God had a real purpose for cutting out the cancer so that the body could survive, so to speak. Well, David wants more information. Down in verse 17, after he gets more information about what has happened, David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan, his son. And he told them to teach the children of Judah the song of the bow. Indeed, it is written in the book of Jasher. Jasher means upright, and this is thought to be some collection of writings, of poetry about the great men of Israel. Something I want you to notice about David. Here he is weeping, crying, lamenting over King Saul. Now remember what Saul has done to David. For 10 years, Saul has chased David through all the cities and all the strongholds of Judah to do what? Kill him, to exterminate him. You would think that when your enemy who's tried to kill you is dead, you're going to dance around and ding dong, the witch is dead, witch oh witch. He's going to be really happy about it. No, not David. Remember, David would never touch God's anointed. He respected the authority of the king. He would never retaliate. And even now, when Saul is dead and his son Jonathan, David has a song of lamentation that he wants to be passed on from generation to generation. Now, this is the way I see it. David prefigures the son of David, the greater son of David, who is 
Jesus Christ. Jesus came into his own. His own did what? Received him not. The city of Jerusalem that he presented himself to would crucify him. So what does Jesus do when he comes to the city of Jerusalem? Does he get angry? Does he start fuming and saying, don't worry, you're going to get yours? No, Jesus weeps over Jerusalem, the very city that would kill him, the very people that had turned away from him. And so David, like the greater son of David, weeps over King Saul and the rejection. You know, Jesus tells us in the New Testament, love your enemies. Do good to those who spitefully use you and scorn you. Now that's, it's easy to quote and it looks good on paper, but it's hard to practice, right? It's hard to love enemies. Revenge is so much more fun. And so it comes naturally to us, but loving and forgiving our enemies does not. However, whenever you retaliate or you exact revenge on somebody who's hurt you. You know what all you're doing is lowering yourself down to their level and being just like them. When you choose the high road of love and forgiveness, when you love your enemies, it'll drive them nuts. I think that's the best retaliation. Heap coals of fire, the Bible says, on their heads. Love them, prefer them, pray for them. You'll find the bitterness leaving, and you'll find your enemies that'll just drive them nuts. That you're so kind that you love them. I think you may have heard the story of the little boy playing with his little sister. And mom heard the scream. It was the little boy's scream. And she ran into the room. And the little boy said, Mommy, she pulled my hair. And he was so angry, he wanted to pop his little sister. And the mom said, Sweetheart, be careful. She's so much younger. She doesn't know that it hurts. Forgive her. She doesn't know. She doesn't know, she kept saying. So mom left the room, and a few minutes later, she heard the little girl scream. Mom went right back into the room, and the little boy was smiling and says, now she knows. <laughs> we relate to that. That's so much easier than forgiveness. We want to let them know. And yet David... Fleeing from Saul, refusing to revenge, always forgiving, saying kind things to him, escaping the spears that were thrown, and now lamenting over him. Go down to verse 25. David says this in eulogizing what has happened. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan was slain in your high places. Speaking of Mount Gilboa. David and Jonathan had a special relationship, no doubt, no question. In 1 Samuel chapter 18, after the whole incident of David and Goliath, the Bible says the soul of Jonathan, get this, was knit together with the soul of David. You could translate that chained, bound, glued together. Knit together. And then in verse 26 here, David says, I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. You have been very pleasant to me. Your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. Now, you know, with all great things, there are people who love to come along and mess with it. And this is one of those texts that the homosexual community has messed with. They have read this text and says, this points to the fact some will say, that David and Jonathan had a homosexual relationship. Well, I utterly reject that. I think to squeeze that meaning out of this is really stretching and ruining the text. You say, well, what does it mean when it says, your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of women? Well, keep in mind, David had not the best marriage. Who is he married to? Jonathan's sister, Right? And it wasn't a great marriage. Remember, David won her in like a bet. And Saul, her father, also Jonathan's father, Saul said, great, I'm going to give my daughter to David so she can be a snare to him. And eventually, she became a snare. She spurned his love. And so, though David was successful in his career, he wasn't really successful in this relationship, for the most part, in any marital relationship. You know, he had six wives altogether. 
So the Bible never flatters its heroes. It tells us the truth. He wasn't great in his marital relationship. He didn't have the best relationship with Michael, his wife, Jonathan's sister. But Jonathan was a loyal friend. That's all this means. He was so loyal that he was willing to set his own future aside and say to David, even though Jonathan himself would have been, could have been the next king. He knew that David was called by God to be the king, so he put his robe on him. He gave David his sword, and he was loyal to him. So chapter 1, that's crying over the king. Now we get to chapter 2. We could call this, again, if you want to write in your Bible, coronation as the king. David here becomes anointed as the king. Chapter 2, verse 4. Then the men of Judah came And there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. So now watch this. Remember when Samuel came to the house of Jesse in Bethlehem and poured the oil over the youngest son, the little shepherd boy David? That was the first anointing, the first of three. It was private. This is now public. But it's not the whole deal. It's not the whole enchilada. He's still only the king over the southern portion. The tribes are not working well together yet. They will be soon when David becomes king. So he's anointed as king over Judah in Hebron, not far from Jerusalem. Later on, he'll be king over all of Israel. So it says, Then the men of Jabesh-Gilead, same verse, chapter 2, verse 4, were the ones who buried Saul. Okay. Saul died on Mount Gilboa. And his three sons died in the battle. Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malkishua, all three sons of Saul, died. There was one son left that was still in Jerusalem. His name was Ish-bosheth. Ish-bosheth. These are not easy names. Ish-bosheth. The commander-in-chief of Saul's army, by the name of Abner, escaped getting killed in the battle. Abner takes Ishbosheth, the remaining son of Saul, and calls him the king over the tribes, over 11 of the tribes. Remember, the tribes aren't working well together right now, yet, until David unites them. So Abner, commander in chief, who's escaped the battle, says, Ishbosheth, the remaining son of Saul, is now the king over these 11 tribes. So now you're going to watch a civil war developing between the house of Saul and the house of David. David is ascending in power. Saul is diminishing in power, or his his house. And it begins with Abner placing Ishbosheth as the next king. So what happens? David's men and Saul's men, or let's say Ishbosheth's men now, are at odds. And in this chapter, we have a fight. Twelve men against twelve men. Abner, commander in chief of Ishbosheth, Joab, commander in chief of David's army, say, let's get 12 guys out there and they'll fight it out. And whoever wins that house, that clan will be the next ruler in Israel. Well, they start fighting, they start competing. Verse 14 Then Abner said to Joab, Let the young men now arise and compete before us. And Joab said, Let them arise. So 12 Benjamites fight. 12 men of Judah. It's a fiasco, and it leads to a bigger battle. So this is what happens. Abner's men lose, okay? So it means Joab, the house of David, has won this little 12-man battle. Abner runs away. He's running away, but one of Joab's brothers, you following me so far? Abner runs away, commander-in-chief of Saul or Ishbosheth. So he runs away because his men lost the battle. One of Joab's brothers by the name of Asael, who's like a marathon runner, he's just a great runner, chases him all day long, just keeps running and running and running. He's a great runner. He's not a good fighter. Abner finally says, you better turn away, boy. I know you're a good runner, but I'm a good swordsman. You keep following me, I'll kill you. Well, Asael keeps following him, and Abner kills him. So now, Joab, when he finds out, is really mad at Abner. Let's see what happens. Um, In chapter 3, verse 1. Now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. But David grew stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul grew 
weaker and weaker. Okay. Joab, commander-in-chief of David's army, goes away on business. In the meantime, Abner, commander-in-chief of Ishbosheth, goes to see David. A private little meeting. It says, basically, David, look, the cards are on the table. I see what's happening. You're the next king. Let's negotiate a handover. I know that God has selected you. I'm willing to turn my master and all of his house and everything over to your hands. And he does it. So he negotiates the kingdom. Verse 21, Abner said to David, I will arise and go and gather all of Israel to my lord the king that they may make a covenant with you and that you may reign over all that your heart desires. So David sent Abner away and he went in peace. Okay, Abner goes away. Done deal. I'm going to turn over the kingdom to David. In the meantime, Joab returns. And Joab finds out, because Joab's still mad, right, that Abner killed his brother. So he's fuming. And as Abner's leaving the city in peace, Joab sees this, goes to David, rebukes David for even talking to Abner. How dare you talk to the enemy? David says he came in peace. Joab doesn't believe him, goes out, chases Abner, and in revenge, he kills him. And so he sheds the blood of war, as David will say, in peacetime. Now, he eliminates Abner. Probably he's thinking for a good reason. I'm the commander-in-chief. Here's another commander-in-chief turning over the kingdom. Maybe David is going to turn on me and make him the next commander-in-chief of everybody. I want to make sure I don't have any rivals. I'll kill him. It'll revenge my brother and make sure that David can't choose Abner as the next commander-in-chief. So the Bible is honest about its heroes. Understand as you go through it. You're going to find some shocking stories in the Bible. Revenge intrigue, sin, breaking God's law. You'll find that on every account with just about every person. So here you have the book, the Bible, inspired by God, telling us the truth about people, not hiding it, not flattering its heroes, but giving us an exact record of what happened. So chapter 1, crying over the king. Chapter 2, coronation as king. Chapter 3, conflict with the king's house. Now we get to chapter 4. This is conflict in the king's house, okay? Now that Ishbosheth has Abner dead, he's very vulnerable. And it says he loses heart. He's very, very anxious here. So while he's vulnerable, a couple of terrorists come in, rogue soldiers. We'll, we'll read them in just a moment who they are. And they murder Saul's son, Ishbosheth. Verse 5 of chapter 4. Then the sons of Ramon, the Berethite, Rechab and Baana, set out and came about at the heat of the day to the house of Ishbosheth, who was lying on the bed at noon. And they came there, all the way into the house, as though to get wheat. And they stabbed him in the stomach. Then Rechab and Baana, his brother, escaped. For when they came into the house, he was lying on his bed in his bedroom, and they struck him and killed him. Now get this beheaded him and took his head and were all night escaping through the plain. Now you got to imagine that. They're escaping through the plain all night with a head. Imagine going everywhere with a head. You walk into a convenience store, you got the head. You're on the road, hi, how you doing? You got the head. All through the day, all through the night. Thinking perhaps David's really going to like this. We have his enemy's head. Now, you know why they thought David would like this? Because after David killed Goliath, the Bible said he cut his head off, and he appears before King Saul carrying Goliath's head. You know, it's kind of a gross, big old, bloody, gnarly head. He wants to get a head, so he brings it. (laughs) And they want to get a head with David. They, They think, we'll bring the head with us. David will really like this. Let's find out what happens. Okay, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Verse 8. <laughs> and they brought the head of Ishbosheth to David at Hebron. Hey, king, got a head for you. And said to the king, Here's the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, your enemy, who sought your life. And the Lord has avenged my Lord 
the king this day of Saul and his descendants. Now things are getting crazy. Heads are being chopped off, all this weird murder and intrigue. You might wonder, why does the Bible include all of these kinds of stories, all of these truthful biographical sketches as gross as they are? Keep in mind, Paul in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says, all of these things were written beforehand for our admonition. There are stories and applications and principles that are very honest so we can apply God's word to virtually every kind of experience that we're up against in life. All of these things were written for our admonition. Well, David sees the guys with the head, but because it's somebody that was the king's son, they do some, uh, he, King David does something to them they weren't expecting. He has them executed and verse 12, cuts off their hands and their feet. So, you know, I see your head and I raise you two hands and two feet. (laughs) So chapter five. Again, if you have the freedom to write in your Bible, maybe with a pencil, not a pen, write confirmation as king over the top of chapter five. Confirmation as king, verse one. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron, and spoke, saying, Indeed, we are your bone and your flesh. Okay. For seven years, David was king over the south before he was made king over all of Israel. And now we're reading about the third anointing, private anointing with Samuel the prophet, public anointing over just the southern portion. That lasted seven years. Now they come to him at Hebron in the south near Jerusalem, representative from all the tribes. And they say, we are your blood your, or your bone and your flesh. And they make him king over all of Israel. Now there has been a civil war between the house of Saul and the house of David. Yet here these men understand, look, we're all Israelites. We're your, your bone, your flesh. This is the tragedy about any civil war because it's bone and flesh fighting against each other. One of the most tragic episodes of our own history. And I know we were fighting slavery and we should always stand against it. But one of the saddest blots in American history is that we had to fight that civil war. State against state, brother against brother. In some cases, families long separated against families. A horrible period of our history. Well, I'm making an application here. We're a family. We're a family of God. We're called into the household, the common household of faith. We're brothers and sisters. We have the same Savior. We have the same Heavenly Father. We're going to the same heaven together. We're going to have to spend eternity with each other. So... As much as lies in you, be at peace with all men. Whatever it takes, avoid fighting, confronting your brother and your sister. You know, one of the uh, tactics of the devil is to get Christians fighting each other. He loves that. He strategizes. He lives for that. Here's why. If the devil can get us distracted fighting one another, it takes the heat off him. We should be fighting the devil and his schemes and his plans for our lives and for our community. That's who we should be standing against. But as long as we're fighting and pulling out each other's swords and cutting one another up, he's off the hook. Let's turn off of each other and turn all of our efforts back onto him. We're flesh and blood. We belong to Christ. Let's always keep that in mind. Fighting another believer is always bad form And they recognize that. We want to be united. We want you as our king. Verse 6. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem to fight against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who spoke to David, saying, You shall not come in here, but the blind and the lame will repel you, thinking David cannot come in here. One of the great highlights and marks of 2 Samuel is that 2 Samuel records this. 
which is the establishing of Jerusalem, the Jebusite stronghold, Jerusalem, as the capital of the country. And it's been the capital ever since, even though Israel's been in and out of the land. Jerusalem, after this point, after it's established, stays the capital. Verse 7, nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David. Now, something about Jerusalem. Jerusalem as a city was strategically located. Back in those days, you know, if you're going to have a city, you have to make sure that it has natural defenses. So they would usually find a city built upon a hill. The city of David was established upon a hill with deep valleys around it. Why on a hill? Because if you were attacked, you could see people coming, running through the valley, so you'd have a wall. But you could see them from the hill looking down in the valley. They would have to come down one hill into the valley, over the wall, and up your hill to attack you. So for natural fortification, you'd build on a hill. Second, you had to have a good water source. And of course, Jerusalem has a great water source called the Gihon Spring. And you don't read about the Gihon Spring in the New Testament. You read about it in the Old Testament. It's the water source. It flows out of the ground. Um, Later on, they dug a tunnel, one of the kings, Hezekiah, all the way from the Gihon Spring to the inner city of Jerusalem, and it ended at a place called the Pool of Siloam. That you read about in the New Testament. So, natural fortification, and number two, a good water source. Well, the Jebusites were so arrogant, thinking their city is invincible. They thought blind people lame people, not even physically fit individuals, they'll be able to stave off any intruders. That's what they're mouthing off to David about. Oh, come on, try to attack us. We're going to put our blind and lame citizens on the wall. You won't be able to get in. Well, they did have a point. Again, strategically located on a hill with a water source. But David discovered a weakness in the water system. As he got close, David found this. And as he stood in the pool of Siloam, he looked up and he said, oh, that's how they're getting their water. They dug a tunnel from the top down to the Gihon Spring. They lowered the buckets down and bring the water up. So he said, and we'll read about this later on. He said, whoever gets up the water shaft and gets into the city, he's the one that's going to be my commander in chief permanently. Joab is the one that made it up the water shaft and he got the job. That breached the fortification and the city was taken by King David. Chapter 6. Again, if you want to write on the top of your Bible or in the margin, you could call this chapter the compromise of the king. The king now is David, not Saul. The compromise of the king. Chapter 6 is about doing the right thing the wrong way. Making compromises because, well, you want to be practical, pragmatic. Let's read verse 1. Again, David gathered all the choice men of Israel, 30,000. David arose and went with the people who were with him from Baal, Judah, to bring from there the ark of God, whose name is called by the name the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. Now think about it. For 70 years, the Ark of the Covenant has been neglected. It has not been in a tabernacle. It has not certainly been in a temple that hasn't been built yet. It's been at somebody's house in somebody's backyard after they got it back from the Philistines. It's just been sitting around. 70 years it's been neglected. So, verse 3, they set the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which is on a hill. And Uzziah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. They brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which is on the hill, accompanied the ark of God, and Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments, of fir wood, on harps, on stringed instruments, on tambourines, on citrums, and on cymbals. Refresh your memory. What was the ark? It was a box. It was a box made out of wood covered with gold. 
The top was a pure gold called the mercy seat. That was the lid of it. The ark had been placed in the tabernacle. The tabernacle was the heart of the community. The tabernacle was a tent-like structure, had a courtyard. Remember, 75 feet wide, 150 feet deep. In the middle of that courtyard was a tent-like structure. And that tent-like structure was 15 feet wide by 45 feet deep, divided into two sections. Uh, 15 by 30 section, that was the foyer called the holy place. And then beyond that, there was a veil. You go through the veil, and that's where the Ark of the Covenant sat, in the Holy of Holies. Once a year, the priest would go through the veil, the high priest, and sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. Now, why was the Ark so important? Because God said, the only place that I will meet with you and atone for your sins is on the mercy seat. Oh, by the way, what was inside the Ark? Do you remember? Three things. A golden pot of manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the Ten Commandments, a copy of the law. Which law the children of Israel broke over and over and over and over again. So effectively, the angels on top, hovering over, are looking down at the failure of the children of Israel. However, once a year, blood would cover the lid. So that the angels were looking down at their failure, the broken law, covered by blood. It's as if heaven, when looking down upon the children of Israel, were looking down not upon their failure, but they had to look at the blood that covered their failure. It's a beautiful picture of Jesus Christ. But this is why the ark was so important. You take away the ark, you take away the atonement. You take away the atonement, there's no salvation, there's no hope. And David understood, we got to get this back to its proper place. Well, look at verse 3 again. They set the ark of God on a new cart. Why'd they do that? Here's why I think. They watched the Philistines years before bring back the ark to Israel, and they set it on a cart. So they thought, well, we'll get a new cart. We'll get the new model cart. (laughs) With nice Michelin tires and chrome wheels. It's going to be a nice new cart. Here's a problem. They're doing the right thing. They're doing it in the wrong way. If you remember your Old Testament, you know that the Ark of the Covenant had to be very specifically carried. Only one tribe could carry it. The tribe of Levi. Only one family in that tribe could carry it. The family of Kohath, the Kohathites. And not only the Kohathites of the tribe of Levi, they had to carry it in a very special way. Not on a cart, not automate it, not be practical and pragmatic. No, the Kohathites had to bear it on their shoulders. There was at the four corners two little, uh, four little ringlets and two poles that went through it, and they carried it on their shoulders. But David is thinking, well, times have changed. This is a modern era. We're not so old-fashioned like they used to be. Let's kind of speed it up a little bit. Let's get pragmatic. After all, it's a nine-mile uphill jaunt. Why carry it on your shoulders when you can put it in a nice pickup truck? So they put it on their cart. Here's the question I want to get to here. I'm leading somewhere with this. I believe they were sincere, don't you? I don't think they were trying purposely to mess with God. I think they were sincerely trying to get the ark back to Jerusalem. Here's my question. Is sincerity enough? See, this is a good thing to ask yourself. Is sincerity enough? Because how many times do you hear people say when it comes to heaven or spiritual things or eternity, well, they're very sincere. Really, is sincerity all that is required? Because you can be sincerely wrong and still sincere. Because if you think, well, sincerity is all you need to get to heaven, really? Well, what if... uh, you were going to get an operation done. And there was a doctor who said, you know, I've never done this in my life. I really, I watched it once, but I'm so well-meaning and I'm very sincere and I'll give it my best shot. Would you go, well, go ahead, because after all, sincerity is all you need. You go, see you later, doc. I want a real experienced surgeon. Well, so it is with spiritual things much more. It's not just doing whatever you want the way you feel like it whenever you want to. It's worshiping God in his prescribed way. And the only way 
to get to heaven, according to the Bible, is one way. Not three, not four, not 15, not make up your own way. But it's only through the Son who said, I am the way, the truth, the life. That's the way it gets done. Verse 6. They came to Nacon's threshing floor. Yuza put out his hand of the ark of God and took hold of it, for the ox stumbled. Again, very practical. The anger of the Lord was aroused and against Yuza, and God struck him there for his error, and he died there by the ark of God. Now, if you were there seeing that, you'd be shocked. What's up with that? Here's a guy trying to steady it so the ark doesn't fall off and get beat up. Practical, pragmatic. Yeah, but you know what? The end doesn't always justify the means. You see, just because God says, I, I want to get something from point A to point B, you got to ask yourself, well, how does God want me to get it from point A to point B? Not just, I'm going to kind of come up with my own way. Okay, remember what God had promised to Abram and Sarah, that you're going to have a son? It's a promise. What did they do? They thought, well, God told us we're going to have a son. He didn't tell us how we're going to have a son. So let's just have a son. Sarah thought, I've got a handmaiden. She's Egyptian. She's young. She's fertile. I'm an old lady. I'm in my 90s. Abram, go lie with her. You have a child. And we'll call that God's fulfillment. It wasn't God's fulfillment. God said, oh, no. I'll bless Ishmael, and I have a plan for him. But it was Isaac that the seed would be called true. Well, anyway, three months later, they finally make it. The ark gets taken up to Jerusalem. No one dies. They do it in God's prescribed way with the Kohathites. Verse 13, here's the story. So it was those bearing the ark of the Lord when they had gone six paces that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. So not only are the Kohathites walking the nine-mile journey up the hill, they're stopping every six paces, you know, just a little extra worship. And they offer an animal sacrifice. They work, walk six more paces, offer another animal. It's like, we're going to go really slow. We don't want anybody dying on this job. You know, we don't want to make God any more angry than we made him. So let's just do it God's prescribed way, but then let's like kick in a little bit extra. And we'll worship and sacrifice on the way. And so they did. Then David danced before the Lord with all of his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of a trumpet. Now chapter 7. Again, if you want to write in your Bible, call this the covenant with the king's king. The covenant with the king's king. The king being David. The king's king being God. That's what chapter 7 is about. Chapter 7, folks, is one of the most important chapters in all of the Bible. The rest of the message of the Bible onward, listen carefully, rests upon this chapter and the promise that is made in it. In fact, I will say this. It's going to be hard to understand the prophets. It's going to be hard to understand the ministry of Jesus. And it's going to be hard to understand eschatology unless you understand this chapter. It all rests upon this. A promise, a covenant that God makes with King David. I'll give you a sampling. The New Testament begins with these words. This is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. And that's put there for a reason. When Gabriel gives the message, the Christmas message to Mary in Luke chapter 1, we read, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Highest. And the Lord will give him the throne of his father, David. And the New Testament closes with these words in Revelation 22. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you that these things in the churches are true. I am the root and the offspring of David the bright and the morning star. So we're going to read about a covenant. Now, David has built his house. And David looks out and the ark has been brought up, but the ark is not in a house, it's in a tent. 
And David's rationally thinking goes, now, I don't know why I should live in such a nice house, and the ark of God is living out there in that tent. So I want to build a temple for God, a house for God. Now, God's going to come and say, you know, actually, I, I don't really care about a big monument or a big building. I, I've been happy in the tent. But David wants to build a temple for God. Verse 10, moreover, the Lord says, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them and they may, that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously. Since that time I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused you to rest from all your enemies. Also the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. That is a lineage, a, a, a genealogy. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your own body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish his throne or the throne of his kingdom forever. Now notice the I wills in what we just read. Several times I counted five I wills that God said. David said, I'm going to build a house for God. God says, slow down, buckaroo. I'm going to do something for you. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. And five times the Lord says, I will, I will, I will. God is making a covenant with David of what God will do. And it's an unconditional covenant. Now, I'll sum it up this way. The covenant states that David will have a son, and that son, we find out, is King Solomon, who will build the temple literally. But also as part of this covenant, the throne of David will be established forever. That will be fulfilled through the greater son of David, the offspring of David, which is Jesus Christ, not Solomon. What we have here in chapter 7 is a blending. Get used to this because it's frequent in the Old Testament. A blending of the immediate and the distant fulfillment all in one. You find that a lot now in the Old Testament where you have two different or three different components, some fulfilled immediately, some fulfilled in the distance. So Solomon, the son, Jesus Christ, the greater son, and the throne established forever through him. Solomon is sort of the archetype of Jesus Christ, the greater son of David. David's house or his dynasty will last until the Babylonian captivity. Then it will be cut off. Now we'll get to this later on in the end of 2 Chronicles and also in Jeremiah chapter 22. You may want to just want to write that little note down, maybe in your Bible, Jeremiah 22, because here's what happens. King after king after king after king comes from David's household, and they all reign. Then there's one king named Jeconiah, or Jehoiachin. He's called a couple of different things in the Bible. But Jeconiah. And he's so wicked, and God finally says, I've had enough. I'm sending you into captivity. And Jeconiah, his lineage, will now be cursed and cut off. There will never be another king from his loins to sit upon the throne. Well, now we have a problem. If God said the throne of David will be established forever, the lineage of David will be established forever, but then God says, I'm cursing that lineage. No more will a king rise from his lineage. How's God going to fulfill his promise? That's a good question. And it's unanswered until we get to the New Testament. And we read the New Testament. We read Matthew and we read Luke. And we find that there's a genealogy in Matthew and a genealogy in Luke. And they're different from one another. And one covers the genealogy of Jesus Christ through Joseph and the other covers the genealogy of Jesus Christ through Mary. Now, was Joseph the father of Jesus? No, he wasn't. He's the foster father, right? Because Jesus was born of a virgin through the Virgin Mary. One of the genealogies covers the genealogy of Jesus through Joseph... And Joseph goes back to David through Solomon and Jeconiah, whose bloodline has been cursed. Mary has her genealogy all the way back to King David, but not through Solomon, through another son of David named Nathan. So you have something beautiful here. 
Jesus has the legal right to reign because Joseph, his adopted foster father, has the lineage all the way back to the throne of David through all of the kings, including the one that's cursed. You say, but it's cursed. You're right. But Jesus has the legal right because of the adoption, the foster father relationship. He has the legal right to reign, but his bloodline isn't cursed. It goes back since he's born of a virgin through Mary to King David. So God can curse the line of David and yet fulfill his promise simply by having his Messiah, the son of David, born of a virgin. That's what solves the problem. It's a beautiful way of God getting out of his own curse, his own problem. There's only one way to do that, and that is a virgin birth. Let's go on. Verse 18. And King David went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me thus far? David is so overwhelmed, he realizes God's greatness and his smallness, that God promised him not only would his son sit upon the throne, but also there would be an everlasting lineage and an everlasting kingdom. And he's just thankful. And sometimes we're at an end of our human language to express thanks to God. Sometimes you just sit in God's presence and you can say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And it's like it doesn't really express all that's in my heart. Well, the next three chapters, and we'll close our study tonight. The next three chapters, you could take eight, nine, and ten together. A conquering leader, a kind gesture, a cold shoulder. A conquering leader, a kind gesture, a cold shoulder. Those are chapters eight, nine, and ten. Chapter eight, David is established. He expands the borders. He takes over more territory. Geopolitical expansion. Military alliances. That's chapter 8. Chapter 9 is a story of kindness. One of Jonathan's son named Mephibosheth is left because David loved Jonathan so much he wanted to show kindness to the house of Jonathan, and so he does. Verse 1, David said, chapter 9, verse 1, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And that's Mephibosheth. Now here's something, again, beautiful about David. Typically, traditionally, historically, when a king came to power... Any possible claimant from the family that he conquered would be immediately exterminated, immediately killed. It was just protocol because there could be a coup later on. So you just go through and you, you wipe them out. David says, is there anybody left from that other regime that I can show kindness to? And that was Mephibosheth. Verse 13, Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he's always at the king's table and he was crippled in both of his feet. David shows him kindness, takes him in, feeds him, etc. Folks, we live in an unkind world. And you know what? You know what that means? Because we live in an unkind world, we have countless opportunities every day. This is what I mean. Because we live in an unkind world, if you would just pause from time to time to show an act of kindness to someone, it'll so blow their mind. It stands out from the darkness so much that that could open up a door for you to share the love of Christ with the person. Today, several of us were down at um, the downtown convention center where we, in cooperation with Joy Junction, fed about 1,500 homeless people. And uh, we were playing music and uh, feeding them. And I was watching the volunteers as they were getting down on their knees and having conversations with them and feeding them turkey and feeding them pie and smiling and engaging in conversation. And, and you just saw these folks come alive, this gesture of kindness went so far. It's so noticeable. And it was with Mephibosheth. Chapter 10 is a cold, cold shoulder. And, and this is how chapter 10 goes down. Next to the nation of Israel, immediately east, was a country called Ammon. Ammon. Have you ever heard of Amman, Jordan? The capital of modern-day Jordan, Amman, Jordan? That is named after the ancient country that used to occupy there, the Ammonites. And um, David extends his kindness to the Ammonites, but it's not received very well. The king of Ammon is a guy by the name of Hanun. 
And Hanun is the son of the previous king called Nahash. Nahash died. David, being a good guy, wants to be kind to the son and gives him a greeting and a gift. But when they see the coalition of soldiers coming, they misinterpret it. They're thinking, that's David. He's trying to spy on us and he wants to attack us and these are foot soldiers. And it really was a kind gesture, but it was misinterpreted and misunderstood. So verse four, Hanun sees David's men, shaved off half of each man's beard, an overture of shame, cut off their garments in the middle at the buttocks, and sent them away. It's amazing what you find in the Bible, isn't it? <laughs> and if you're a dude and you come back with your beard all gnarly and your head all gnarly and your, kind of your, your skimpy little mini skirt, it's very embarrassing. These are emissaries of the king. And it was done deliberately to shame David and his men. Now, as soon as the Ammonites did it, they thought, uh-oh, we really blew it. We made a mistake. They knew that David would attack them, and so what they did is they hired 33,000, 33,000 Syrian and other mercenaries. It's like, oh, we blew it. David's going to attack us. We need help. So they hired these guys. David says, Joab, go out and get them. Joab divides his men into two companies, and they defeat the Ammonites. It's sad. It's sad because this, this misunderstanding costs the lives of 50,000 men. And it caused their province to be subjugated by David. He would have left them alone. So this is how I want to close. Even though God selected David, man after his own heart, next king, and God gave him the authority and God gave him the kingdom, David still had battles to fight. Receiving the promise of God, coming into the authority that God had for him, yet David had battles to fight. And you know what? We will too. God has inheritance for you. God has a portion for you. and says, here, occupy this. Here, walk in this. Here, enjoy this in your life. And yet, battles will come. And so you'll wonder, is God really in control? Is he really in charge? Is God directing me? Why are things not working out? Because you may have an expectation that says, once I come to God and commit my life to God and commit my day to God, everything's going to flow smoothly. Get that out of your head. That's a misplaced expectation. You see, the Lord wants you and I to mature. Wants you and I to trust him. And sometimes we can really develop our trust deeply only when we're going through the fire. So if you're wondering, why the fire? Why the trials? Why the scars? How could you ever grow and be Christ-like without them? Amy Carmichael, who was a missionary, wrote a beautiful little poem, a little treatise of, as if, if Christ were speaking to us, asking these questions. Hast thou no scar, no hidden scar on foot or side or hand? I hear thee sung is mighty in the land. I hear them hail thy bright ascendant star. Hast thou no scar? Can he have followed far who has no wound or scar. How many of you have scars in your life? Emotionally? Spiritually? Oh God, why would you let that happen? Because I love you, that's why. I want you to grow. I want you to mature. You're following the one who got beat up and was rejected. So, we're growing, we're learning, and yet walking in victory and in the inheritance God has for us.